Mark 14, we're going to begin where we left off. That's why I like preaching the Word of God. And that's why you need to come back on Sunday night because you're going to miss it. And uh, why am I fussing at y'all? Y'all here. Amen. It's you that didn't come that you ought to be here. Amen. Uh, Mark chapter 14, verse 32 through 41. And unfortunately, the people that don't come usually don't watch on, on the Internet either. They got something else to do. Amen. All right, Mark chapter 14. Brother Randy was called into work, so pray for him. I know he didn't want to do that, but sometimes you got to get the ox out of the ditch or the motor out of the whatever. Amen. He was so convicted about that message Tuesday, he tried to get up a diving trip Friday, and the work wouldn't let him off. So Jason Blaine went on anyway. So they're scriptural. Amen. Praise God. Just launch out in the deep. Amen. That means go deep sea diving. Amen. I don't even like to put my head under the water. Amen. I cheated when I had my swimming test. It had uh, three fingers in the water. I'd look at it after I got out of the water. I never would open my eyes underwater. Would you? Or my mouth. That would have been disastrous. I'd drain the whole pool. But uh, anyway, Mark chapter 14. Let's get serious. Amen. Verse 32 through 41. And uh, i got plenty of time, so I won't keep you long. Y'all want to stand in all the Word of God? Amen. I do. Matter of fact, I think I'll do what Brother McDaniel said. I'm going to get me a chair and sit down, and y'all stand the 45 minutes. How many vote for that? Say amen. One person? And that's Brother Larry, because he wants to see y'all stand. Amen. Y'all stand. I'll sit for 45 minutes. That'd be scriptural. Jesus sat when he taught. Uh, but I ain't teaching. I'm preaching right now. But um, uh, I think we can stand for 10 minutes. The Bible says in Mark chapter 14, verse 32, I want to preach a message entitled, The Place Called Gethsemane. In verse 32, it says, And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and said to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. Boy, what a thought. Jesus praying for us. And he taketh with him Peter, James, and John, the leadership of the disciples, and he began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on, on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father. Not everybody can pray that. Abba, Father. All things are possible in thee. Take away thy cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will but what thou will. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping, and said unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst thou not watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. And when he had returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither wist they what to answer him. And he cometh the third time and said to them, Sleep on now, take your rest, it is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go low. He that betrayeth me is at hand. You may be seated as I pray. Father, thank you for the good song service. Enjoyed that song about you giving a song in the night. I started thinking, dear God, all the time was night for the author of that song. And Lord, you gave her over 7,000 poems and over 5,000 songs to sing in the night. And she was blinded as a little baby. Thank you, dear God, for God-honoring, Christ-honoring songs by, brother, by Fanny J. Crosby. And Lord, help us not to whine in our valley. And God, help us not to give up when it's dark, but God, help us to pray. Help us to watch and pray. May we, God, be illuminated by the Spirit of God and the Word of God as we pray, and that we pray scripturally and spiritually, be escorted into the presence of God when we pray, and dear Lord, that we wouldn't sleep, that we'd watch and pray. For Lord, we know you're coming soon. We know, Lord, souls need to be saved. Thank you for saving those two little fellows that got saved this morning. Thank you for our junior church team. 
Thank you for the preaching of the Word of God. Thank you, God, we don't just get up there and play games, have skits. God, somebody takes the Word of God and preaches it. These little hearts, so desperately needing you, trust you. And Lord, what a miracle. Lord, thank you. God, I pray that you'd use these young men. God, I pray that you'd help them not to have history repeat themselves itself and have terrible homes like they live in. God, please, God, help them grow spiritually. And we'll thank you and praise you for using this message to help us grow spiritually. In Jesus' name, amen. When I began this series on Mark in Mark several months ago, I told you it was fast action. It's a lot of action. Uh, Mark is a, uh, pictures Jesus as the servant that's moving to Calvary. And now in chapter 14, uh, we see the Lord Jesus Christ in a moment, in a few hours, give his life a ransom for many, for you and I. He's about to go to the cross. He's about to die for your sins and pay your sin debt. But we join Jesus and his men once again, and they're in the midst of an event, eventful night. They just finished the Passover celebration that we preached on and observed last Sunday night. It was such a precious time of testimonies and the sweetness of the Holy Spirit. I'm glad you opened your heart and worshipped Him last night, or last Sunday night. In verses 12 through 26, we see the celebration, and He changes the whole Passover to, uh, hey, this is my body and this is my blood. They'd never heard that before at a Passover supper. It turned from a uh, from the uh, a Passover supper to the Lord's supper. We call it the Lord's supper. I'm not sure about the word communion, but praise God, it is sweet communion when you take the Lord's supper in fellowship. But folks, then he goes on to Cal- he goes on to Gethsemane. He goes through the Kidron Valley to a place called Gethsemane. The Bible says in verse um, 32. And as he's going to that place called Gethsemane, he goes over what's recorded in chapter 14 of John, chapter 15 of John, chapter 16 of John, and chapter 17. That was his last messages. And he taught them about heaven. He taught them about the peace of God. He taught them about surrendering to the Lord and the coming of the Holy Ghost, the paraclete coming alongside. And he prayed this wonderful, powerful prayer in John 17 which I believe is the Lord's Prayer, amen? And he prayed for you, and he prayed that we'd be one, and he prayed that we would uh, glorify him and, and that we'd be sanctified by his very word. That's what he was teaching. And then he goes into the garden, leaves eight of them at the gate, has three of them, the inner circle, the leaders, said, come on, boys, we got to pray, and I want you to pray with me. And he left them at a place, and then he went a few steps, maybe a few yards into the garden, and he fell on his face. He begins to agonize about what he's about to endure and what he's about to see and what he's about to experience for your sin and my sin. And so I want to give you this place called Gethsemane tonight as a place of eternal business, a place that was transacted for the glory of God in a place of pressure, a place of prayer, and a place of priorities. And folks, I want you to know, first of all, I see it's a place of pressure. If you don't think there's pressure in the ministry, you got another thought coming. I'm going to tell you something, folks. The devil is a roaring lion seeking to devour your joy. And I will say this, he can hit you time you get out that door and he can hit you not in the rear as the door hits you in the behind, but he can hit you in the heart before you even get out of this place. That's right. He can cause animosity, jealousy, bitterness. He can cause vainglory, selfishness to spew out of you in a second if you yield to the flesh instead of the spirit. He can ruin everything in a good service before you get home. You ever had a fuss and fight in the car on the way home? Don't raise your hand. Because I know every one of you have, amen. You got over one child, you probably had it. Amen. They threw a shoe and hit you in the back of the head, and you said, where did that come from? Amen. Had to pull them off the road and give them a little spanking. That's happened on the way home from church, I'm sure. 
Uh, you might have had a fuss with your wife. You might have had a fuss with your husband. You don't know what happens, but I want to tell you something, friend. The word Gethsemane means olive press. And rightfully, it was a place of refuge because many times Jesus went to this place called Gethsemane. Peter, James, and John was with him, and he goes deeper into the uh, garden, but then there's an amazing thing that takes place that puts the pressure on our Lord. He sees the wrath of God. He sees the hell that he's about to bear at the cross of Calvary. He sees the wrath of God. He sees the pure fury of God upon sin, and that's exactly what he thinks about sin. And folks, sin should not be a play toy to you. Sin should be exceedingly sinful in your life. Because that sin put Jesus on the cross. So we shouldn't play with sin. We shouldn't uh, low-rate sin and, 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 and reduce sin to some little uh, misconstrued uh, personal health problem. It's sin. And sin is exceedingly sinful. Look at verse 33. It says, And he taketh him, Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. Now, he wasn't sore amazed at the sleeping disciples. He knew they were going to sleep. They were totally exhausted, totally despondent. They just told him he was going to go to the cross, and they didn't quite understand it, and they just went to sleep. And folks, I want to tell you what he was sore amazed at. He looked into the cup that he was about to drink. It's the cup of salvation for you, but it was the cup of judgment for him. And the reason we're saved is because he took our judgment. He took and the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus took your debt, took your debt, took your hell, that you don't have to go there. Amen. He took loneliness so you'd never be lonely. He took your pain and agony so you'd never have to be painful in agony and thirst in hell. Oh, what a Savior. Then he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. The word exceedingly means overwhelm. And it's, the, it's where we get the word periphery. It means to be surrounded or overwhelmed with sorrow. Have you ever felt like you was just overcome with sorrow? You just felt like there was no way to turn. There was no place to turn. Maybe a tragic death. Maybe a, a, a terrible wage of sin came tumbling down in your family's life, and you look to the right, you look to the left, you look to your preacher, you look to your brother or sister in Christ, but there was still sorrow in your heart. Jesus was overwhelmed with sorrow. And then we see it says uh, in this verse, even unto death. Even unto death. Jesus was overwhelmed emotionally and spiritually because he was about to enter into the wrath of God for your sake. He knew no sin became sin for you that you might be made the righteous of God in Him. What an exchange. And folks, in Gethsemane, what makes it so precious, just for a few minutes, he knew what he was about to suffer, some intense pain. I'm not going to go over it because I've been over it before, but you know the scourge was terrible. Isaiah said he was astonished beyond recognition in Isaiah 52, I think it's verse 10. He was beat to a pulp, and you couldn't even tell he was a man. He's not that beautiful picture you see with the loincloth, and he's hanging there on the cross with a little crown on his head uh, around the uh, uh, table in your living room. No, he was beat beyond recognition. 39 stripes furled his back. Cat of nine tails, metal and bone, glass, Embedded in those lashes. His, his, his beard was plucked out. There was a crown of thorns with six inch thorns crashed on his head. And then they spat in his face and cursed him and slapped him and said, If you're Christ, tell me who hit you. There was some physical pain. But folks, not only was there physical pain, he knew that he was about to become sin on the cross. There was emotional pain. I think there's a song entitled this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, folks, your sins weighed much more than the old rugged cross. What he had to bear for you hurt more than any physical or emotional pain that he suffered. It was emotional pain. 
He looks and his disciples are asleep. I guess if the top three were asleep, probably the, uh, the rest of the eight was asleep, and Judas definitely was asleep spiritually. He was lost. He just denied him. Or was just about to come with a bunch of soldiers. And so there was a time of extreme internal pressure. You ever been worried? It's a sin, but you still worry. You said, no, I'm just concerned a lot. No, you worry. Worry means strangled. Worry means pulled in two directions. And folks, the only cure for worry is the grace and spirit of God in your life. Folks, people are so depressed they kill themselves because of worry. And folks, there's external pressures. Uh, he prayed, and the Bible says he sweat great uh, uh, drops of blood mingled with sweat dripped down his face. That's pressure. That's pressure. It was a place of pressure. Spiritual pressure, emotional pressure, a physical pressure. And then I believe it was a time of infernal pressure. The devil was trying to kill him in the garden. He tried to kill him when Herod said, I'm going to kill all the, uh, the babies because he'd heard the king had been born in a manger. Wise men said, where is he? He said, I don't know where he's at, but I'm killing all the babies. Folks, he tried to kill him, and he tried to kill him over and over again. Uh, he tried to uh, uh, cause him to sin, but he never sinned. So it's a place of pressure. He took your sin. It's a place of pain. It's a place of agony. A place of loneliness. So you'd never have to bear that. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. And then second of all, it's a place of prayer. Look at verse 35. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, that means Papa, that means Daddy, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou will. He said, Lord, I'm going and I'm going to do what you want, but is there another way? Maybe the human side, the Son of Man was, was coming out then. He said, man, I, I don't want to have to bear that, but I will. And folks, we have the same pri privilege of calling him, calling our Father in heaven, Abba. Romans 8, 15, through the Spirit, we're called, we're adopted as firstborn children and we can pray, Abba, Father. We can have a relationship with God. And folks, listen, uh, this, this cup, he, he fell on the ground, forsaken, abandoned, judged. As I said, this cup represented the wrath and hatred of God against sin. It sim symbolized the full, undiluted wrath of God that was about to be poured out on Jesus as the Lamb of God. What an altar! What an offering. What a sacrifice. What a lamb. And I see, first of all, that it's a, the object of prayer was the Father. Abba, Father. I see the oppression of prayer. Satan was opposing him as he prayed. Folks, I want to tell you something. If there's one thing the devil will try to do in your life is to keep you from praying. I mean really praying. And folks, I want to tell you something because he knows the weakest... Christian get right with God and gets on his knees that's the strongest power on this earth and so no wonder you have problems with your prayer life no wonder you have problems falling asleep and I'm not talking about just physical sleep I'm talking about spiritual sleep we stop watching and we play in the battlefield instead of pray on the battlefield God help us there's a time of spiritual oppression like no other time and there was spiritual oppression like no other man suffered Jesus all of the gates of hell was bombarded in the dark hours of Calvary it's described in Psalms 22 it says the bull of Basham that's all the demons of hell was bombarding his soul but the Lord prevailed and so there was oppression in his prayer but there was obedience in his prayer he said father is there another way and then the Lord said, no, there's no other way. And he just said, well, not what I will, but what thou will. And that spoke to my heart as I close tonight and tell you this. One of the greatest things about prayer is that it crucifies our will. 
One of the greatest things about prayer is it crucifies our flesh. It mortifies the deeds of the flesh. One of the greatest things that we ought to pray is, Father, thy will be done. God be glorified. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And folks, I believe a lot of times we pray amiss because we pray to consume it upon our own lust, James chapter 4, verse 2. And I want to just say this, and I want to say it clearly. One of the greatest miracles on this earth is when the Spirit of God helps you to die to self. I asked Dr. Lee Robinson, sitting right up here on this platform, one of the last few times he preached here, I said, what makes the difference in one great man of God and another man of God that does nothing? He says, it's a matter of yieldingness, and it's a matter of dying to self, son, dying to self. Have faith in God, but die to self. Boy, I never forgot that. And the Bible teaches it over and over again. It's folks, if we're going to do anything for God, we've got to get out of the way. If we're going to do anything for God, we've got to learn to pray. And if we're going to pray, we need to mortify the deeds of the flesh and not come in a fleshly attitude of, Lord, you owe me, but folks, we owe everything to God. And so the greatest lesson in Gethsemane, yes, it was a place of pressure. Yes, it was a forecast of, of uh, the great victory that was won at Calvary uh, in a few days, but thank God it's a place of prayer. Thank God because of Calvary we can pray. Thank God because of Gethsemane we can pray. Jesus did pray through, and we don't have to pray through. We can pray too because he said it is finished. Father, forgive them. They don't know what to do. What was he doing on the cross most of the time? Praying, praying. He prayed every, before every miracle. He prayed after every miracle. Prayed all the day long. Prayed all night for his disciples because he knew what they'd go through. And folks, I want to tell you something. We win the victory when we submit to his will. And he did it willingly. No one took his life. He laid it down. Praise God. Praise God. He did all that for one reason, so you wouldn't go to hell. Amen. He went through all that pain, all that agony, all that hell on the, earth, on the cross so you wouldn't go there. Amen. He prayed fervently and he looked back and the disciples were passed out. I believe we ought to be like those two little boys. I believe we ought to be enthusiastic. I believe we ought to be excited about the Lord. And I know some of you wouldn't get excited and wouldn't smile if Jesus walked in the room. But I'll tell you this, friend, we ought to be at least expected. We ought to be open. We ought to be encouraging the man of God when he preaches. We ought to encourage uh, the young people when they get saved. We ought to make a big deal out of somebody being saved because it is a big deal. Yes. We, ought to, we, ought to, we ought to do our best to visit. We ought to do our best uh, to do uh, what we can do to teach and be available. But I want to tell you something, folks, the most we could ever do for these children and the most you could ever do for me, and the most you can do for each other is pray. Amen. Pray one another. He said in John chapter 4, verse 34, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. He said in John 6, 38, for I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Folks, the problem was men get in the way. No human encouragement could help him at that day. He wasn't dependent on those disciples to pray with him. Folks, there's sometimes that nobody will encourage you by praying with you. And nobody will go soul winning with you, but you need to go on anyway, and you need to walk with God, and you need to get out of your prayer closet on fire for God, illuminated by God, and see this world through his eyes and have a, a, grateful, a grateful appreciation for what happened at Calvary. Don't ever get over it. The joy of the Lord is your strength. There ought to be some joy about your salvation. You ought to remember if it wasn't for Christ, you'd be in hell. And all your family would be in hell. But Jesus took your place, and it started at Gethsemane. And so it's a place of pressure, it's a place of prayer, and then I want to close by saying it's a place of priority. It's a place of priority. Folks, first of all, they were the priority of the master. He said, it's my me to do the will of God. I came down heaven not to do my own will, but thine will. Folks, he had a priority, and that priority was this. 
I must be about my father's business. He said that when he was 12 years old. And they found him in the temple. Wasn't concerned about his family. Wasn't concerned about the caravan home. He was in the temple with God's word. And he said, I must be about my father's business. Isaiah said he set his face like a flint towards Calvary. He never wavered. Praise God, he was on Calvary's road the whole time he was on this whole earth. The devil tried to knock him off, but he stayed on his knees. He stayed in the spirit and praise God, there was no human encouragement like God's encouragement. And so the priority was this, My, thy will be done. But then there's a priority of men that comes out in this, these verses. Look at verse 37. It says, and he cometh and he findeth them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, sleepest thou, because thou not watch one hour. Hey, by the way, have you ever tried to pray one hour? It'd probably be the longest hour of your life. Come on, say amen. You used to have all night prayer meetings right here on Friday, and some people fall asleep, but praise God they were trying. Amen. I ain't going to tell you about Randy snoring during the prayer meeting. I don't, t- I don't talk behind somebody's back. Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. Folks, God commanded his men to watch. And Folks, the same three men that fell asleep at Gethsemane fell asleep at the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17. Our Lord's priority was the will of God, the will of Abba Father, the will of having a relationship with God an intimate relationship with God where he could call him Abba Father, but praise God, he wanted his will done more than his own will, and what he was about to do for you was terrible, excruciating pain. He took your sin. So he came in verse 37, he said, Simon. Notice he didn't use Peter's name, he used Simon. He used the, the he, didn't, he wasn't acting like a rock, that's why. Peter was boasting that he would die. He knew he wouldn't die. He was going to cuss and deny him three times. But he couldn't even stay awake. I mean, Jesus is praying. Jesus has preached. That will encourage me, praise God. If If they fell asleep on Jesus, why should I get upset when you fall asleep on me? Praise God. I put a goat to sleep one time in Colorado. Kyle told me that story again right before I... Uh, I married him. He said, remember that time that we couldn't get that goat to stop uh, uh, stop being or baying or blowing or whatever he do all night, amen? Goating, neighing. What, do you, what does a goat do? I don't know. Something. He does, but he was keeping them all up. And, and, he, and, and, and uh, for some reason, Kyle put a tape on, a cassette tape of me preaching, and that goat went on off to sleep and didn't say another word the whole night. And he had enough courage to tell me that happened. He said, we tried John R. Rice, Jack Howes, but we put you on, and the goat went right to sleep. I said, well, I've got a lot of goats that go to sleep, amen? It's the sheep that stay awake, amen? (laughs) Hey, friend, listen. Peter bragged and said, I'll die for you, and he couldn't even stay awake during the prayer meeting. Boy, that shows the weakness of our flesh, don't it? (laughs) Woo! And I'm tell, I got three fingers pointing back at me. I'm weak. And folks, you're weak and you're frail. And all you that think you're big trees, boy, I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes you holler inside and the raccoons are, are making a nest. And greater the, the, the bigger they are, the harder they fall, like I preached this morning. And your flesh is wretched, weak, and wilting. You depend on the flesh, you're going to fall. You're going down. We want to enjoy victory in our times of temptation and testing. Let's learn from the Lord. We must lean on His power, but we must depend upon His power. And folks, if we're going to stand, we must first kneel. Prayer meetings are important. And I'm not talking about the prayer meeting at 530 that some of you won't go to. Now don't worry me. It's the prayer meeting that you don't go to every day in your private place of prayer. Folks, you need to have a place of prayer. You have a place that you go in and say, Holy Ghost, crucify the flesh. Holy Spirit, speak to me about your will. Holy Ghost, speak to me about my selfishness, my vainglory, my pride, and burn it out of my life. 
that I might shine for thee. Well, let me just close by saying this. They were self-confident in verse 31. They slept in verse 37. They were tempted in verse 50, and they sinned in verse 50. It says they all fell away. They experienced disaster. Because I want to tell you something, folks. It's disastrous when you fall away from God. I told you about the preacher this morning. I told you about the missionary this morning. But I want to tell you something, folks. I could give you thousands of names over the 41 years I've pastored this church since I started that little storefront. And there's thousands and thousands of casualties. I'm not talking about people changing their letter and changing their membership to some liberal church. That hurts enough. I'm talking about people that don't even go to church today. They don't care about God. They could care less about God. And folks are just going around living their own life for their own will, their own vainglory, and it is sad and it's disastrous. And their children don't have an example. Their grandchildren don't know about God. And they're just going on like life is, is normal. And folks, it's a tragedy. Amen. It's a tragedy. Don't think for a minute that the same thing can't happen to you that happened to these disciples. That's right. If Peter can cuss and deny, you can too. And folks, that's why we ought to stay close and clean to the Master. Close and clean. Let me just conclude by this. What a joy it is to know that our Savior fought all the battles for us and he won. It was a battle in the garden. We think of all that he endured that night because the cup was shown to him. The will of God was shown to him. Your sins were shown to him. He was at the point of death. He was exceedingly sorrowful. It was like a periphery that was all, all around him. It was crashing down on him. And we ought to exalt him for that. Amen. We ought to worship him. And we ought to be loyal to him. Yes. And when he says watch, you ought to watch. When he says pray, you ought to pray. When he says speak to, for me on the job place, you ought to speak for him. When he says hand out that track, you ought to hand out that track. When he tells you to go soul winning, you ought to go soul winning. When he tells you to go t uh, uh, help somebody that's discouraged and despondent, we ought to help them. We ought to, we go, ought to go to them. We ought to go alongside. We ought, to, we ought to be that comfort. We ought to be that strength. We ought to be the hand of God. We ought to be the heart of God. We ought to be the voice of God. Amen. Because God has chosen us to be a vessel for His honor and His glory. And it's not all about you. Amen. And it's not about me. Thy will be done. Yes. Now how can we get that done? Well, number one, we need to stay awake. We need to stay awake. I'm not talking about in the service. I'm talking about spiritually speaking. Every day you ought to be alert and watch and pray. Turn to Romans chapter 13 in closing. Romans chapter 13. You knew I was going to go there. Maybe you didn't. But look at verse 11. This is amazing verses to me. Romans 13 verse 11. You there? Okay, I'll wait on you. Somebody said no, so I'm waiting on you. Amen. I'd rather you speak up here than act like you're not even listening and say amen. Yeah. Look at this, verse 11. I once had a guy interrupt my whole sermon and said, you mean, and he was a traveling evangelist, brother. He was Brother Atkinson or something like that. He was the weirdest dude I've ever seen. He'd win more people to Lord hitchhiking than I've ever seen a man in my life. That was his full-time ministry, hitchhiking. You don't do that today, do you, amen? Right. Unless you want to give your life as a ransom for many. But... uh uh, and he, he sat on that second row, and I remember he, every sentence I said, do you mean to say? And he was trying to encourage everybody to listen. I thought he was questioning me. I was a young preacher, sweating behind the ears. I was nervous as a cat in a room of rocking chairs when that man walked in. Matter of fact, he walked in again. I said, oh, no, I don't know how to handle him. It was Brother Atkinson. Uh, he was uh, um, a great soul winner out of North Carolina. There's some real... Weird people come out of North Carolina, but there's some powerful people come out of North Carolina. Amen? Don't listen to all that Mike McDaniel says just because they don't root for Florida, praise God. And I'll never forget. He said, do you mean to say? I said, yes, I do mean to say it. And if you don't quit, quit asking me this, that question, I'm going to lose my place in preaching. Nervous is a nervous wreck. 
But look at verse 11. It says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. That salvation means salvation from the presence of sin. That's called rapture. Amen. That's called your death. You never know when you're going to die. So you live each day as if it's your last. Look at verse 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Say amen right there. You ought to be a brilliant testimony. You ought to reflect the glory of God. There was a battle one time in the Old Testament where the men got uh, shields that were not of gold and they had uh, fake gold. It was brass, I believe it was. And uh, uh, when the sun hit it, there was not a reflection. But when they had the pure gold shields, there was reflection in the eyes of the enemy, and the enemy was slain. Folks, there's an armor of light. That's the armor of God's Holy Spirit. That's the armor of prayer. You win the war on your knees. Look at verse 13. Let us walk honestly as the... As in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife or envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh Amen. to fulfill the lust thereof. Whew. Folks, we're in a warfare. And folks, we're in the last days. And we need to be realizing what this warfare is all about. It means you need to stay awake. And you need to watch and pray. You need to put on the whole arm of God. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6, and I will close. All God's people said, I, I wonder. Here it is. It says, finally, my brethren, I know, he, I know that... Uh, Paul was a Baptist preacher because he closed several times too. Finally, my brethren, he went on to preach 20 minutes. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Those disciples said, we don't need to pray. We don't need to watch and be vigilant and, and prayerful and alert to the devil's attack. We don't need to be awake to the will of God. We just need to slumber. But look at this. He said, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness in the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You're no match for the devil. I preached on that this morning. I'm not going to re-preach it. But look at this. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. That means watch and pray. Look at this. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. You know what that's saying? It's saying you've got to realize the truth, there is a battle. Most people do not realize that we're in a battle. They think it's a game. They think it's a convenience. Hey, they think it's a buffet. They think they can serve God when they want to and when they're will to. But I want to tell you something, folks. We are called to serve God full time. We're called to be vigilant every day. We're called to watch and pray every day. We're called to have a prayer closet. We're called to go out with the gospel every day. We're called to be a witness on the job every day, every moment. There's no part-time Christians around here. We're all full-time. But look at this. Gird about. See, in the Bible days, they'd gird up like Hercules and they'd put it in the belt of truth and they were agile. They had that flowing tunic, they'd put it... The enemy would put the tunic over their head and cut their head off. And so it's battle ready. You know why most people aren't battle ready? Because they hadn't prayed about anything lately. And they're asleep. And folks, they're AWOL. And folks, they don't really believe there's a battle. They're really having a good time in the Christian life because it's all party. It's all contemporary music. It's all showtime. And folks, I want to tell you something. It's more than just showtime. It's old time religion. And that old time religion tells us that we're in a battle and our flesh is weak and the devil is strong and the will of God is precious. And if you miss it, you've missed it all. Let me just close. It says the truth. Having on the breastplate of righteousness. When you're in the battle, 
If you're not right with God, I'm going to tell you what will happen. The devil will accuse you, and you'll faint in the battle. The accuser of the brethren. If you're not right with God, and you try to wield the sword, you're going to be picked apart. Some people can't even worship. They've so, so, got so much blooming sin in their life. And they ain't repented of it. They ain't come to the altar. Maybe I ought to have the altar call at first. Because I want to tell you something, folks. You try to worship in the flesh, it's a joke. Amen. You try to witness in the flesh, it's a joke. You try to preach in the flesh, it's a joke. You try to deek in the flesh, it's a joke. You try to do anything for God, teach in the flesh, it's all failure. It's all futile. That's what the disciples were learning in the place of pressure, in the place of prayer, in the place of priority. There is a battle. There is a battle. It's going on. We're not soldiers. We're warriors. We're in a warfare. God's called us to overcome. But how do you overcome? Well, you take the truth, put on the breastplate of righteous, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In the Bible days, if you lost your footing, you was in trouble, so they put cleats on, big, long cleats. I don't know if they were steel cleats or not, like Ty Cobb used to wear and tear everybody up when he was slid in second. But I guarantee you, it was stable. And I'll tell you what's stable, the gospel. You believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That'll keep you stable. Hey, man, that'll keep you on the front line instead of sleeping on the back pew. No offense back there. Taylor looked at me real hurt then. Praise God. Sleeping during the prayer meeting. Sleeping spiritually when people are around you that are lost and going to hell. And what do you do? You're just going to make another buck at your job, and you let them go to hell. You're asleep. Let's go on. And taking the shield of faith, wherein shall you be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Folks, I want to tell you this. If you ain't praying, you don't, you don't have any faith. The Bible says you ought to come to him believing that he is, and that he's rewarded them that diligently seek him. It's impossible to please God unless you come to him believing he is. What is that? Prayer. That's prayer. You go out soul winning, you hadn't prayed about it, hadn't read your Bible, you are full of yourself. And we're not here to send out super salesmen for Jesus. We're here to let the Spirit of God work through you. Amen. Whew, let me go. It says, and above all, take the shield of faith, quench all the fire, and then take the helmet of salvation. I'm saved. How about you? And the helmet of salvation, 2 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8 says, it's a helmet that you know is going to be staying on there, that you're not going to lose your salvation every minute. That'll defeat you in the warfare. Hey, if you don't even know you're saved, how in the world can you battle Satan? If you don't know you're saved, how in the world can you win somebody else to the Lord? If you, if you don't know you're saved, how can you take new ground for Jesus? But look at this, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. So the Word of God opens up your heart for the Spirit. The, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The Spirit does not work. If it's not scriptural, it's not spiritual. Let me just close by saying this, friend. Here's the whole key of putting on the armor. Verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Watching, there's that word, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. The Lord was about to win the greatest victory on this earth. He won it at Calvary. And he looked at his disciples, and they're asleep. Could you not watch one hour? You said you'd die for me just a few minutes ago. And I can imagine the excuses the Lord heard. But folks, I want to tell you this. They did wake up. And God used them as martyrs. God used them as great preachers. As a matter of fact, the Bible says they turned the world upside down. They woke up. And I'll tell you what will wake every one of y'all up. He's alive. The death, burial, and resurrection will wake you up. God has called us to a place of prayer. God's calling you right now to a place of prayer.
you don't have a place of prayer, you probably don't have a prayer life. It can be an old chair in the study. It can be some rocks out back, Brother Lamar up in the woods. But there ought to be a place of prayer. And that place will be a place of great pressure. It'll be a place of great times of prayer, but it'll be a place where you get your priorities right and you'll say, Dear God, I'm your soldier. I'm your warrior. I'm your representative. I'm your vessel. Fill me. Escort me into your presence by the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Gethsemane. Thank you for a place of prayer, a place of pressure. God, a place where you sacrificed yourself to go to the cross and prayed that beautiful prayer that we ought to pray, not my will, but thine be done. God, forgive us for living for ourselves. God, forgive us for playing games on the battlefield. God, help us to realize we'll never put on the whole armor of God unless we first pray in the Spirit for each other, for all saints. 